Okay, great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, to see so many of you joining in for the third of these sessions on, on OpenMP. So I'm going to start off this afternoon looking at synchronization. So let's just remember why we need synchronization. So uh, whenever we have multiple threads accessing shared variables, then we need to ensure the correct ordering of reads or writes uh, and to make sure that we avoid any race conditions. So we avoid the possibility where one thread could be writing and another thread could be writing or reading the same shared variable uh, at the same time. And there's a particular special case of this. We need to update shared variables, but uh, in a way that's protected. Um, so because if we, uh, if we make a modification to a shared variable, that is not a single indivisible atomic action by default. Um, so we take some special care to make sure that only one thread at a time can do that kind of thing. Okay, so the first mechanism I want to talk about is, is the barrier directive. So um, we've already really met barriers uh, because we've been talking about how threads synchronize at the end of a parallel region. Um, but a, a barrier is a full synchronization point amongst all the threads. So no thread can proceed past a barrier until all the other threads have arrived. So OpenMP is actually full of implicit barriers because there is an implied barrier uh, at the end of the loop directives. So at the end of do or for loops, there is one at the end of sections. So I haven't really talked about sections. That's another, uh, it's another work sharing directive, um, which uh, isn't really used very much these days. Uh, and also at the end of single as well. Okay, so if we have a, a single construct, then if you remember, uh, one thread will execute the block of code, the other threads skip over the block and wait in a barrier for the block to be executed. So typically most of the barriers we end up using in OpenMP are these implicit barriers at the end of the loops, at the end of parallel regions. Um, but sometimes we want to code an explicit barrier at some point inside parallel region. And there is a barrier directive that lets us do that. Um, so the syntax is no surprise. It's in Fortran exclamation mark dollar OMP barrier or in C and C++ hash pragma OMP barrier. So there's no code associated with this directive. It's just a point where the runtime is going to insert barrier synchronization. I have to think a little bit carefully about the control flow if we use directives like this, because either all threads or none of them must encounter the barrier. Otherwise, our code will deadlock because if some strict subset of the threats, threads in a team uh, get to the directive, they will wait there forever because they're expecting all the threads in the team to arrive before they can proceed past the barrier. So this control flow is, um, problem is also true for the work sharing directives as well. So if we have a, uh, a work sharing do or for or, or a single, then we have to arrange the control flow in such a way that either all the threads will execute that OpenMP construct or none of them will. Uh, we, we, we can't allow some strict subset to encounter these kind of uh, constructs that contain barriers. So it's a little bit difficult to have an example where you really need a barrier that will fit on foot on one slide, but let, let me try anyway. So uh, what I have here is a, a piece of code and I'm thinking about organizing my threads in, in a ring. So, uh, so every thread has, a, has notionally 
a neighbor thread. So what I do in this parallel region here is I read the thread number and then I, I designate a neighboring thread. So then my neighboring thread is going to be the thread with the ID one less me, uh, unless I'm thread zero, in which case it'll be the last thread. So having set that up, uh, then some point in the parallel region, every thread is going to use its thread ID to write an element of this array A. And then some point later, I want to read the value that my neighboring thread wrote. Okay. So that the, the right of A, before the, which is, comes before the barrier here, and the read of A after the barrier must happen in that order. Yeah, so I must have I must make sure that no thread will will read the value from its neighbor before its neighbor actually wrote it. So one way I can arrange that is to put the barrier directive between the write and the read. So that means that I'm guaranteed that by the time the reads happen, all the writes which occur before the barrier have indeed already happened so that the read of my neighbor's value will indeed pick up the value that it wrote. So the next type of synchronization I want to look at are critical sections. So a critical section is a block of code which can be executed by only one thread at a time. And this is exactly what we need if we want to protect and update shared variable. So we want a piece of, to designate a piece of code to say that many threads may execute this at some point, but when they do execute it, I'm guaranteed that only one thread will do so time. So the syntax looks like this. So Fortran, it's critical directive followed by a block of code and then end critical uh, and then CC++ hash pragma OMP critical followed by a structured block. So the structured block, as usual, consists either of a single statement or a set of statements in curly braces. And again, a one-slide example is a little bit uh, contrived, but uh, let, me, uh, let me try and motivate what's going on here. So I want to have a code which has some um, structure in it which represents a stack of tasks. So what I want to be able to do is to allow a thread to pop a task off the stack and then go away and execute it. And then at some point later, it may put some, it may create some new tasks and I want, the, want it to be able to push those onto the stack. So I want to have multiple threads executing and potentially pushing and all of them pushing and popping tasks onto the stack and to have that done safely, but to allow the threads to do the actual processing in parallel. Okay, so let's try and talk through this piece of code. And so, uh, we have a parallel region, so we have multiple threads executing, uh, and we have some some we have this stack object, which is a shared data structure. So all the threads have access to the stack. So the two calls that I have here, so uh, there's a call to get next, which will take a task off the stack, and 
then we can go away and call work, which actually does some, does some, does the, sort of the computation. And then that will potentially generate some new tasks. So if new parameter is not zero, then that new task will be um, put back on the stack. So I want to be able to make sure that only one thread at a time, a thread at a time accesses the stack. And I can do it like this with these critical regions. So the way that critical works is that the rule is that if a thread is in one critical region, then no other thread can be in any critical region. So this does indeed do what I want. So if a thread, if one thread, for example, is inside the first critical region executing get next, then I'm guaranteed that not only can no other thread be in that critical region, but also that no thread can be in the second critical region and executing put new at the same time either. So critical regions form this, this method of mutual exclusion for threads. So only one thread at a time can be in any of these critical regions. The next thing I want to talk about is the atomic directive. So in some ways you can think of this as a special case of critical. So the sort of simplest use case for critical is a, sim a simple update to a shared variable, which is a basic type in the underlying language. So think integers or floating point values here. Um, so this uh, it just protects a single update to a shared variable. Whereas, as we've seen before in the last example, we can have any arbitrarily complicated piece of code inside a critical region. An atomic directive just protects a single statement. Okay, so what it, the, the, uh, the syntax is, is straightforward. So uh, for Fortran on this slide, it's OMP atomic followed by the statement. Uh, and the statement has to have the form where it's an update. It can look like, you know, x equals x. Uh, followed by an operator and then some expression. So classic example here would be x equals x plus some expression. Or the expression can come first, or we can also allow certain intrinsics here. So the common ones would be max and min. So a statement like x equals max of x and something else would also fit this pattern. And we can use an atomic statement to atomic directive to protect that statement as well. Pretty much the same idea applies in C and C++ as well. Um, what's allowed is slightly different. Um, statement must look like, again, looks, must, must use a binary operator in this case, okay, because uh, that's that's the sort of clean way of doing it in, in C or C++. So it must look like something like X plus equals some expression, or we can have the shorthand for, for adding and subtracting one, so X plus plus or, or plus plus X. And have a list of, of allowed binary operations. One way that this is different from critical is that the evaluation of the expression is not part of the protection. So it's only the update to the variable on the left hand side that is protected here. So and if so, uh, if there are any side effects inside the expression, so if that happens, if the expression happens, for example, to call some function which modifies some shared variable as a side effect, then that that's certification is, is not protected by the atomic. You would need to use a critical for those circumstances. 
So why this separate idea? Uh, why have why support these two different methods of doing and doing an update? The reason is that Atomic allows for some optimization. So uh, we hope, though we can't actually guarantee that implementations will do Atomic more efficiently than they are able to do critical. So this is particularly true if the value, if um, the thing on the left hand side happens to be an array element because then that allows the implementation to protect different array elements separately. So, uh, and we'll come across this in the next example. So, if diff so as long as different threads are updating different elements of an array, then the updates can proceed in parallel. And it's only if the updates refer to the same element of the array does the mutual exclusion actually need to happen. Another way of thinking about the difference here is that essentially critical protects access to a block of code and therefore implicitly to any shared variables that happen to be referenced inside that code. Whereas Atomic directly protects the access to the storage which is denoted by whatever happens to be on the left hand side of, of the statement. So atomics also don't interact with critical, so you can't use critical to protect a variable in one place in a parallel region and atomic to protect it in another place uh, and expect mutual exclusion from both of those. That doesn't work. You either have to use, they either have to be both critical or both atomic. Okay, so here's an example here where we would really, really need to use Atomic in order to get, in order to have any hope of getting any performance out of this, this kind of example. Um, so what this example does is it computes the degree for every vertex in a graph. Okay, so the little diagram down on the right hand side here represents a graph. So a graph consists of vertices, which are the dots, and those are joined by edges represented by the red lines. The degree of a vertex is simply the number of edges which are connected to it. So the rightmost vertex here, for example, it has three edges connected to it, so its degree is equal to three. So the computation I would like to do here is to have a loop which loops over every edge and then increments the degree count for the vertices at either end of that edge. So if you can just ignore the OpenMP directives for, for a minute here. So I have a for loop over the number of edges. Then for each edge, so for edge J, I, I look up the element vertex one, which is the index into this array of degrees. Uh, and I increment elements of the degree array by one. And then in the next statement, I look up the vertex at the other end of the of edge J and use that to, to also index the degree array and update or increment that count by one as well. So by the time I've finished executing this loop, I have an array of degree values uh, for every, so one, one value for every vertex in the graph. So now I'd like to do this in parallel. So 
clearly I have a problem here because it's possible that two different edges both share the same vertex at the end. And therefore it's possible that if two different threads are working on two edges that happen to share a vertex, then it's possible that these updates could interfere with each other. So I could have a, uh, a race condition here. So two threads both try to uh, update the same element of the degree array at the same time. Then I may have one of these non-deterministic bugs where one of the elements, one of the dates to that element may indeed get lost. So I need to synchronize these updates correctly. And in this case, the neat way to do this is with the atomic directive. So you'll notice that if I replace the atomics with critical, then I would end up with no parallelism at all here. Because I would guarantee that only that any thread could only be accessing the degree array at a time. So only one thread could be accessing any element of the degree array at a time. So that would effectively sequentialize the whole of the loop. And in fact, it would go slower than the sequential version because I'm adding the overhead of, of the critical regions. If I use atomics instead, however, that allows the OpenMP implementation to protect the updates to different elements of the degree array uh, separately. So as long as threads are accessing different elements of the degree array, then that can proceed in parallel. So hopefully I'll get plenty of parallelism out of, out of this example. Okay. So you want to think of a case where the number of edges is large compared to the number of threads. So the, the chances of them actually trying to update the same elements uh, are, are fairly small, uh, and in which case most of the updates can proceed happily in parallel, and I should get some reasonable performance out of this example. So, Although I talked about graphs here, because that's a, that's a nice clean concept, um, you also find this, this, this pattern also turns up in molecular dynamics simulations. So what you tend to have, so think of it now, now instead, you know, think of, the, think of the dots as particles, think of the red lines as force interactions. And so typically, if I compute forces between pairs of particles, then I need to update the force sum uh, for every particle. Um, so I, have, I, I end up with precisely this pattern where if, I, if, uh, if different threads are considering uh, pairs of particles that happen to share a particle, uh, then we can end up in this, this same situation where two threads are trying to update the force for a particle concurrently, and I need to protect that somehow. So critical and atomic get us uh, through most of the common use cases where we want to protect uh, modifications to shared variables. Um, but sometimes we need a bit more flexibility and that's where lock routines come in. So a lock is a special variable that has this property that it can be set by a thread then no other thread can set the lock until the original thread which did set it has unset it. So for those of you familiar with things, this is, these are just classical mutex locks. So in OpenMP, a lock, uh, setting a lock can either be blocking 
or non-blocking. So we can either, for our, for our threads, can either try to set a lock if the lock's currently not available, if it's because it's currently set by some other thread, then the thread that calls the set will block until the lock becomes available. Alternatively, we can have a non-blocking set. So this, this call will attempt to set the lock uh, and it will always return straight away and it will return true or false depending on it with whether it was successful in setting the lock or not. So locks have to be, in OpenMP, locks have to be initialized before they're used. Uh, and then when you're finished with them, you can destroy them and free up any associated memory. The specification says that lock variables should not be used for any other purpose. So basically what that means is that um, you're not allowed to store any data values inside them. So here, here are the lock routines. So um, these are defined for Fortran. They're defined in the OMP underscore lib module. And so we have five routines. We have init lock, which does the initialization. We have set lock, uh, which does that. So that's the, the blocking set. So that will wait until the lock is available. We have Somewhat confusingly, we have test lock. So test lock is the non-blocking set. So that returns true or false depending on whether it succeeded in setting the lock. Then we have the unset and finally the destroy to free up the lock, any memories associated with the lock. Um, so for modern Fortran, you can ignore this stuff about, uh, about the type of the variable. You simply use the OMP lock kind that is defined in the module uh, and everything will be happy. So we have the same set of routines in, in C. Uh, so this time they're defined in the header file omp.h. And again, we have a predefined type here to use. So this is uh, OM OMP log T. And we have the same five routines, init, set, test, unset, and destroy. So I could also solve my graph problem using locks as well. Um, why might I want to do this? Well, if the update is something more complicated and uh, the, uh, the data structure I'm trying to, trying to update is not a basic type, then I can't use atomics. So if it's uh, some, some complicated update to a structure, then I may need to use locks or if it can't be expressed in a single statement, again, I might need to use locks here. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to declare an array of locks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare an array of locks which is exactly the same size as the number of vertices. So I'm going to logically, as in my program, associate one lock variable with every vertex. So I need to initialize those things. So the, the first loop here is just does the initialization. It calls OMP init lock for every element of that lock array. So now instead of using atomics, I can solve the same problem. And this time, whenever I want to update a element of the degree array, I look up the corresponding lock in the lock var array and set it, do the update to the degree array, uh, 
and then unset that lock again. And then I have the uh, the corresponding set update and unset for the for the vertex at the other end. So that's a way of solving the same problem, but using locks instead. So for those of you who are doing the exercises on Cirrus or on your own machines, there's the exercise that's associated with this lecture is indeed a little molecular dynamics uh, simulation. So the, the code I supplied is a, is a very simple molecular dynamics simulation of, uh, of, 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 a, of, of a melting crystal. And there's several source files here, but the computation is completely dominated by the calculation of force pairs in, uh, in the subroutine called forces. Um, so it's pretty simplistic. It basically it does uh, it does an all to all with a cutoff radius. So it's um, it's not a highly optimized algorithm here, um, but it's uh, enough. So uh, we essentially have a, a a double loop structure over which uh, which enumerates the forces between all the pairs of uh, all the pairs of, of atoms here. Okay, so okay, the question. Okay, how would you choose between using locks and atomics? Uh, okay, if you if the situation allows you to use atomics, okay. So if you're if you meet the meet the requirements for atomics, which is you have a single statement update of the prescribed form to a variable of basic type so if, you know uh, a floating point or uh, or integer value typically then you should use atomics because that allows the uh, the most optimization so locks would be useful if you have an update that doesn't meet that type of requirement and so if it's if it's not a basic type or if you have uh, an update which is more complicated than what can be expressed in a in a in a single statement. So you can try playing around with with uh, with all of these inside this in this example. So what I suggest you do is you start off by parallelizing the routine with a you know with a, with a parallel region and a work sharing do or for directive. Uh, and and first of all, use critical sections to uh, to protect the updates to the to the array of forces. Then once you've got that working, you can see okay, uh, does that really scale very well with a number of threads? And you should find that um, well, it probably doesn't. Okay, so once you get to around about eight threads, six or eight threads, you will see some noticeable drop off in performance. So then you can try using uh, atomics instead or, or using locks to achieve the same thing. Or there's actually a completely different way of doing this, this problem, which is using the reduction array. So that's also explained in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, accompanying notes. Okay, so let's uh, let's reconvene at uh, at three thirty, and I'll talk about some uh, uh, some further top. I'm going to cover a bunch of different stuff in there, um, uh, which none of which is worth a whole lecture in itself, but it's a useful useful selection of, of odds and ends of other features, which uh, which you will no doubt find find handy. Your uh, start programming with OpenMP for in for anger in anger okay great I'll, uh, I'll i'll see you again soon okay welcome back everybody um so to say this is uh, the further topics lecture so in this i'm 
going to cover a few different topics. So in particular, I'm going to talk about parallelism, uh, then uh, orphaned constructs. I'll say a bit about thread private globals, and I'll finish off with a slide or two about timing routines. So let's start thinking about nested parallelism. So um, multiple levels of parallelism are supported in OpenMP. So what happens is if we're, if we're already executing inside a parallel region and a thread encounters another parallel directive, then another new team of threads will be created. Um, and this behavior is usually turned off by default. So you normally have, in most implementations, you need to turn that on either by setting the OMP nested environment variable or by calling the OMP set nested routine. So if nested parallelism is disabled, then the code will still execute, but all that happens is that those inner teams only contain one thread. So in effect, in effect, what happens is that the inner parallel regions get serialized. So we don't create any additional threads, but the code will still work. So as a simple example, suppose what we've got is we have um, two completely independent loops here. So if you, again, if you, for the, for the time being, if you just ignore the uh, OpenMP directives uh, uh, and look at the, the, the two do loops here, I have uh, the do I loop, which uh, writes some values into an array X. Uh, and then I have a do j loop, which writes some values into a different array, which is y. So um, I have the potential to, because those two loops are completely independent of each other, I could consider executing those two loops in parallel on different sets of threads. Okay. So let's see how that works. So what we can do here is, OK, so at, at the very beginning of this code, we have the parallel region. So this is going to be an outer parallel region. Uh, and then so what I'm going to do is saying, OK, I'm going to, uh, and we'll talk more about how we control the number of threads here in, in a minute. But uh, suppose that I've arranged it so that I'm going to create two threads for the outer parallel region. So I then read my thread, uh, thread ID with OMP get thread num. And then if, my th if I'm thread zero, then I go and create a team of threads with the parallel do directive, which will share out the iterations of the I loop. Okay. And if you look on right here, I've shown the thread zero creating three other threads to make an inner team of four threads here. And then similarly, if, uh, if I'm thread one at the outer level, I will also create a team of threads with the second parallel do directive, which will execute the J loop in parallel. Okay. So, and, and again, I've chosen, uh, as I will, come to how we control all these different thread numbers in a, in a minute. So again, I've chosen to use uh, a total of four threads to execute the J loop. So that's thread one in the outer parallel region plus three new threads. So it turns out we don't really need to use this particularly often. Um, it, but it can be useful if we do have an application where there's a, there's a clear outer level of parallelism, um, but that doesn't contain enough parallelism to keep all our threads busy all the time. Uh, so that's the kind of situation where nested parallelism can, can, be, uh, can be useful. Okay. Um, 
it isn't necessarily supported in some implementations, though that's less common these days. All, all, of, the, all of the main common compilers that you're likely to come across um, do in fact support nested parallelism reasonably well. But uh, it's actually uh, enabling nested parallelism does in, introduce some additional overheads. The, uh, the OpenMP runtime has to do a bunch of extra work to be able to support it. And so the message here is basically don't, don't turn it on unless you're using it. So let's now look at how we can control the number of threads. Um, so there's several different possibilities here. So the simplest one is just to use the environment variable. Um, so the environment variable OMP num threads, which we've so far used just to set it with a, a single value to control the number of threads in, in the top level parallel regions, that actually can take a comma separated list. So that says how many threads to use at the different levels of parallelism. So if I set OMP num threads equal to two comma four, that will use two threads at the outer level and four threads for each of the inner teams. So that will do the trick uh, for the example that I showed on the previous slide, where I indeed I wanted two threads at the outer level, one to execute one, one loop, the other one to execute the other loop, uh, and then a total of four threads uh, in each of the inner parallel regions. So that's convenient as long as you do indeed want the same number of threads for all of the inner teams. Um, you may not want to do that, uh, in which case you have more flexibility. So you can either use the OMP set num threads function, or you can use the num threads clause on the parallel region. So let's look at uh, look at num set num threads first. So um, this is a slightly complicated example, but it, it shows you the kind of flexibility that you have here. So here I have uh, a outer loop. Uh, so look at the the i loop here is a, is length four. So, and then that contains a, a J loop, which is of, of length N. So if I wanted to, to do this with, with, uh, with nested parallelism, then I have this kind of flexibility. So suppose I want two threads for the outer parallel region. So each of those threads is going to do two iterations of the I loop then I can call OMP set num threads in the master thread outside the parallel region. So then when that thread encounters the outer parallel do here, it'll create a team of two threads. Then once I'm inside that outer parallel, I can then use, again, use OMP set num threads uh, to control the number of threads that are used for the inner parallel region, which is going to execute the, the J loop here. Um, so that means that not only can I, so I previously, I'm assuming that I, I set up an array called inner threads with some values in it. So, you know, so OMP set num threads, you can pass a variable or an array element into that. It doesn't have to be a compile time constant. Um, so here I can use different numbers of threads. So not only for each uh, parallel region controlled by every thread, but in fact, for, for there are going to be a total of four instances of that inner parallel region, uh, two on each of the outer threads. So I could choose to use a different number of threads for all of those instances of the inner parallel region. So what OMP set num threads does is it says, this is the number of threads that will be used for the next parallel region encountered by this thread. 
So OpenMP has, uh, has a notion of, uh, of things called internal control variables. So there are, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, nominally some in internal state in the OpenMP runtime, which controls various aspects of parallelism. Uh, and one of these uh, control variables is, is in fact this, uh, is, is doing this. It says this is the number of uh, threads that will be used for the next parallel region. Uh, and every thread has its own copy of that internal control variable. So every thread can independently choose how many threads it's going to spawn for the next parallel region that it encounters. Um, so there is some there 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 is a for historical reasons there is a, there is a naming consist naming inconsistency in the in the library here. So the, for that internal con control variable, OMP set num threads does indeed set the value of that thing, but OMP get num threads does not return that. And OMP get num threads, as we've already seen returns the number of threads that are executing in the current parallel region, not in the one that's about to be created. If you want to actually uh, read the value of that internal control variable, uh, there is another function you can do that Do that with. It's called OMP get max threads. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit next week. Um, but there is, a, there is this kind of naming inconsistency. And the other option you have is to use the num threads clause. So this works in uh, a kind of similar way, but it says, you know, this, this allows you to control uh, for every particular instance of a parallel region. You can put the num threads clause actually on the parallel directive. Uh, and that's, uh, that just says how many threads will be used for, for this instance of the parallel region. So there's, there's a bit of redundancy there. There are different ways to do this. Uh, so which is, which is most convenient um, may just depend on, uh, on the way that you structure your code. So the order of precedence here is that if you use OMP set num threads, that overrides anything you set in the environment variable. If you have a num threads clause, that in turn overrides anything that was in the internal in internal control variable uh, set by set num threads. So the clause takes precedence over the internal control variable, which takes precedence over the environment variable. So there's some more control that you can have here. You can so it's easy that you can this is uh, using nested parallelism is, is an easy way to to create an awful lot of threads um, and it can be hard to avoid oversubscribing your hardware so typically you don't want to create more open mp threads than you have say hardware cores or hardware um, hardware threads or virtual cores or hyper threads or whatever you happen to like to piece of hardware so there's some additional functionality here. You can control the number of maximum number of threads that are running at any one time with environment variable OMP thread limit. So you can so if you if I if I say export OMP thread thread limit equals 64, that means that there will never be more than 64 threads running at any one time. So that's a useful way of, of specifying, you know, of matching that to my hardware resources and, and, and telling the runtime not to oversubscribe. And so you can also control the maximum depth of nesting. So you can say OMP max active levels equals two, uh, which says that there will, uh, there will only ever be two levels of thread creation. And then there are also a bunch of utility routines in order to be able to uh, figure out the thread IDs and number of threads executing uh, at every level of this uh, of this tree of threads. Um, 
So uh, to start off with, OMP get level returns the level of parallelism of the of the calling thread. So uh, and that will return zero in the sequential part of the program. So we just call that on the master thread that returns zero, and then inside the first level of nesting that'll return one and so on. Uh, OMP get active level uh, does something similar except that this ignores levels which are inactive. So that means it ignores any levels that only consist of one thread. So this is how many levels have I got where there was actually new thread creation. Uh, and then once I know, uh, once I know my, le my level, I can uh, call uh, get ancestor thread num at any given level. So that returns the thread ID of this thread ancestor thread at any given level. Uh, so, for example, if I want the if I want the ID of, ID of my parent thread, then I call OMP get level, subtract one to go one level up, uh, and then call OMP get ancestor thread num with that as its argument. Uh, and then I also have get team size, which will tell me how many threads are executing. At, uh, in this thread's ancestor team at a given level. So I have the ability to, to figure out all the, all the possible thread numbers that I could, could ever want to know. So I just wanted to say a word about nested loops because uh, nested loops is a certainly a common use case. I say uses, use cases for nested parallelism are not particularly common, but one you might think about is, is nested loops. Um, so there, this is actually such a common use case. There's, there's in fact, in fact, there's a more efficient way to do this than to create nested teams. So if we have, uh, if we have perfectly nested rectangular loops, Okay, so uh, let's think about what that means. So perfectly nested means there's no intervening code between the loop constructs. So for example, there's no, no in, this, in this example here, there's no code between the, the four int i uh, and the four int j, and similarly, no code between the, the curly braces at the end. So that's, that's the perfect nesting bit. The rectangular bit means that the information space is rectangular. So the indices of the inner loops or the bounds, sorry, the bounds of the inner loops do not depend on the value of indices of any loops further out. Okay. So it means that the, the bounds of all the loops must be independent of, of, of the other loop indices. So provided we meet those conditions, we don't need to use nested parallelism to do this. Uh, what we can do is use the collapse clause instead. So in this example, we can say hash pragma OMP parallel for collapse two. Uh, and the argument two is the number of loops to collapse starting from the outside and counting in. So you know you may you may be in a situation where you have a, a, a nest which consists, say, of, of of four loops, four nested loops, but you only want to parallelize the out the outer two. So what that does, it transforms this code into a single loop of length. So in this case, that'll be of length n times n, uh, and then it will then parallelize that generated long loop. Uh, and schedule that as well. So if you can, if you apply a schedule clause to this, then the chunk sizes and and the schedule choice, so static, dynamic, guided, or whatever, uh, refer to the implied big long iteration space of length n times n. So this is useful if we're in the situation if the the uh, the number of iterations in the outer loop is sort of the same order of magnitude as the number of threads. So that means that parallelizing the outer loop uh, may not have very good load balance, uh, whereas parallelizing the inner loop incurs the overhead of uh, of of a parallel region for every for every value of i. So this is this is a way of uh, of doing this with uh, with fewer overheads. <clears throat> 
And as long as we have this particular case, this particular use case of perfectly nested re rectangular loops, then doing it this way with the collapse clause is, uh, is more efficient than using nested teams because we're not in the business of creating and synchronizing any additional threads. Okay, so let's go on now and think about orphaned directives. So this is a feature of OpenMP which, uh, which is very useful uh, in that it allows us to write modular code and not have to uh, mess around or re refactor existing code too much. Um, so what does this mean? Okay, so it means that so the sort of official statement here is that uh, directives are active in the dynamic scope of a parallel region, not just its lexical scope. So it's essentially, it means that we can do things like this. We can have a parallel region with a subroutine call inside it, and the subroutine may contain, for example, a loop with a work sharing directive. So the work sharing directive does not have to be in the same pro in the same program unit as the parallel region which it which it belongs to. So that's very nice because it allows us to preserve a modular programming style. Um, it's a little bit complicated if the call tree is uh, is messy. So uh, so what happens in this previous example? So let me let me go back a slide here. So what, what would happen if I called Fred from outside parallel region? So I have a master thread encountering a work sharing directive without a parallel region. Uh, and the answer is that just works fine. Essentially what happens is that the, the work sharing directive is ignored and the loop gets executed sequentially. If we do this kind of thing, we need some extra rules about data scoping. So um, what happens with shared and private variables when we call a subroutine from inside uh, a parallel region? So that depends what we do here, but there's, there's, there's several rules that apply. So variables in the argument list inherit their data scope attribute from the calling routine. So essentially, if we uh, if they're shared, if variables are shared in the parallel region and we pass them in, then they will be shared inside. Uh, if they are private in the parallel region and we pass them in, then they will be also be private inside the routine. Uh, so then we have to think about okay, what about global variables? So uh, global variables in C or C++ or the equivalent in Fortran, which would be uh, old fashioned common blocks or uh, more usually these days module variables. Um, so again, those things are shared by default uh, unless we declare them as thread private and I'll come back to that later. Next rule is about static and save so local variables inside the inside the routine if they have the static keyword in c and c plus plus or if they have the save attribute in fortran uh, those are shared okay. um, but all other local variables declared inside the routine are private to the thread So if you understand how memory allocation works, um, then one way to think about this is, is, is to think about uh, stack allocated and heap allocated memory here. Okay. Um, so the way OpenMP works is that every thread has its own stack, but all the threads share a single heap. So essentially what, what happens is that uh, stack allocated memory is private, so every thread gets its own copy, uh, whereas um, heap allocated memory is, is shared. So if that makes no sense, then don't worry about it. But if you, if you think about it and 
if you do think about that kind of that way, then that that sort of helps to make make sense of these rules. So that brings us on to thread private glo global variables. So this is a convenience feature. And I would recommend that you don't design code to use it. Um, however, it's useful if you end up trying to parallelize legacy code, existing code that uses, that makes extensive use of global variables using OpenMP, because otherwise it can, it, it might mean a whole lot of refactoring um, to try and make private copies of those things uh, and pass them around through argument lists and so on. So it's uh, so for porting legacy code, sometimes it's just more, much more convenient to allow each thread to have its own copy of, of variables with global scope. So again, this is common blocks and module data in Fortran or file scope and namespace scope variables in C and C++. So the way this works is that if we're inside a parallel region, then every thread has access to its own copy of this. Um, so if you're outside a parallel region or if we're in a master directive, then the access is referred to the master threads copy. So the way we, the way we do this is with the thread private directive. So thread private directive takes a list. So in Fortran, that list can contain uh, common blocks or module variables or variables with the save attribute. And this directive has to come after all the declarations for the common blocks or variables. And it must appear wherever they're declared. So if you're using old fashioned Fortran with common blocks, it must appear up after every declaration of the common block. So in other words, everywhere it's used, uh, you must have the thread private directive as well. A similar idea in C and C++, have hash OMP thread private uh, and a list of variables. Uh, so that this directive must be at the file or namespace scope. It has to come after all the declaration of the variables and before any references to them from, from actual executable code. Okay. And there are some other restrictions which, uh, uh, which, are, which are, best, are, are best examined by, by look, going and looking at the standard. I'm not going to go into them today. Um, another piece of functionality we have is a copy in clause. So what that does is that allows the value in any values in the master threads thread private data to be copied to all other threads at the start of a parallel region. So what you can do is you can set the values in the master threads copy in the sequential part of the program and then use a copy in clause which will replicate those values in every threads copy uh, on entry to the parallel region. Uh, and the last of this collection of topics for this afternoon is about timing routines. Um, so uh, we're often interested in, uh, if we're interested in parallelism, then we're almost certainly interested in performance, uh, and therefore we might also be interested in uh, timing pieces of code. And so OpenMP supports a, uh, a portable timing routine. So this is called OMP get W time. Uh, and it returns a the current war, war clock time in seconds as a double precision floating point value uh, relative to some arbitrary origin in the past. Uh, and you can also ask for what the what the precision is with OMP get W tick. So the normal way you would use this is. Uh, to say, okay, I have a piece of code that I want to be timed, would call this routine before the piece of code and store the value uh, and then call it again afterwards uh, and take the difference. 
So uh, these timers are nominally local to every thread. So if you want to do this, then you are, uh, and you want the difference to make sense, then you are supposed to make both those calls on the same thread. Um, you don't have any guarantees about the resolution, um, but in practice, most implementations are pretty good. You will get uh, at least um, microsecond uh, resolution from, from this routine on, on most implementations. So it's, uh, it's, it, it'll work fine if you, even if you want to measure some really small pieces of code, you can still use this thing. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite nice in the sense that it's, uh, it's operating system independent uh, and it also doesn't suffer from the nastinesses of some of the built-in timers in, in, in C or Fortran. Okay, so if you're following along with the, uh, with the exercises at home, then uh, one thing you can do is to uh, use the molecular dynamics example again and um, make use of orphan directives. So in the first version, what I would get you to do is to parallelize the loop inside the uh, forces, uh, inside the forces function. Uh, but what you can do is you can experiment with orphaning. So you can uh, move the parallel region outside into the main program, but you keep the work sharing directive on the loop inside forces. Um, so this is just an exercise, it's really just an exercise to see what happens in terms of, uh, in terms of the variable scoping. Um, it's, in this particular example, it doesn't have any performance benefit, um, but it, it's, it's a, a useful example so that you can see how, how orphaning works and how it changes the way that you have to declare variables as, uh, as shared or private, or reductions indeed. Okay, great. So that was all I was going to talk about in, in this session. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of that or, or anything else indeed? There's a question that says, what, what's the difference between thread global variables and, and shared variables? Okay, so this is complicated terminology. So uh, local and global variables are properties of the underlying sequential language. So that's local in, uh, local variables have this simply the, uh, uh, in C or Fortran are variables which have, which only have a scope for the uh, function in which they're declared. Whereas global variables are uh, program-wide objects which can be accessed from essentially any, any function. So local versus global is a property of the underlying sequential base language. Whereas uh, private and shared and thread private are, are properties of OpenMP things, okay? So global variables are these variables which are accessible from anywhere inside program in, in the base language. By default, those things are shared in OpenMP. Uh, so however, what, uh, what we may want to do is a directive to change that behavior uh, and give every thread its own copy of global variables. So the terminology is complicated. Okay? So local and global is a property of the base language. Shared and private and thread private are, are properties of, uh, with respect to the threads. So the question is, is there nested parallelism in orphan directives? So the, the answer is no, okay? So having orphan directives does not create any additional threads. So um, if you use a, if you, so you have, just have to remember that work sharing directives don't create threads, okay? So a do directive or a for directive does, does not create threads. 
it just shares the loop iterations out between the threads in the existing parallel region. Uh, and with orphaning, all that's happening is that that parallel region is creating threads somewhere further up the call tree. Okay, so I'd just like to remind you about the, uh, the course chat page. So if you think of any more questions or you have any problems uh, or questions that crop up when you're doing the exercises, um, please feel free to post and uh, we'll be monitoring that and, and, and answering questions on there. Okay, great. Thank you for listening in, everybody. And I uh, hope to see you for the last session next week. So in that one, I'll be talking about some uh, tips, tricks, and gotchas. So all the little, all the all the little things that are useful and helpful, and things that you know, things that can trip you up in OpenMP. Uh, and then the last session will be about performance. So we're we'll thinking about you know what. Well, what what are the possible things that can go wrong uh, with uh, with the performance of OpenMP codes and some some ways to fix that? So uh, yeah, thanks very much, and um, see you all next week. <laughs>